LinkedIn presents. We introduced iTunes, our digital music jukebox, and this quickly became one of the most popular digital music jukeboxes in the world. And it led us to a remarkable device called the iPod. And Welcome to Rethink Moments. This is a show about big ideas and events that in some way change the way we think. I'm your host, Rachel Botsman. We're going to start by focusing on listening. And we're going to focus on the most exciting thing in listening, and that's the iPod. How thin and light So it, there was one call that came through to my phone. It was Barry Schuler, who was the head of AOL. And Barry had Steve Jobs on the phone. And he said, Steve wants to talk about music. He wants to talk about a solution to the problem. Would you meet with him? I said, of course we would. This is Paul Vidich. Paul might just be the most influential person in music you've never heard of. We were taken up to the second floor Apple boardroom. It's a big room. The double doors to the boardroom open and Steve walks in. It's 2002 and the music industry is in chaos. Napster's been shut down, but there is still no clear copyright ruling. New subscription services, music devices, and illegal digital downloads are carving up the market. Paul, as a leading figure at Warner Music, enters the Apple offices for a showdown with Steve Jobs. He was sitting and rocking back and forth in his chair. And at one point, he leans forward and in a loud voice says, you guys in the music industry all have your heads up your asses. I leaned forward and looked at Steve and said, Steve, you're right. And that's why we're here. Today on Rethink Moments, we're pulling back the curtain on the critical iTunes deal that completely transformed the way we listen to music. And he paused, and and it was clear he was a little confused. It's like he had just sort of insulted us. (laughs) And I had humbled myself before him, and, and he didn't know quite what to do. How do you know when it's time to disrupt your industry? And what needs to be sacrificed to make it happen? Stay right with us. Paul's journey to brokering the iTunes agreement began when he joined Warner Music as their seventh employee in 1987. He headed up corporate development strategy from their New York City office on 52nd Street. It was Paul's job to find ways to future-proof Warner's interests. But by the late 1990s, there was a problem that nobody predicted. At that time, the CD was the dominant, predominant format. The worldwide industry had $36 billion of revenue. It was highly profitable. And everyone was sort of getting huge bonuses and very happy with the way things were. And then something called Napster came along. And it was at that moment in time when the technologies had all converged to allow very rapid downloading of small files, MP3 files, that could be shared. And that file sharing sort of swept you know, not only the United States and Europe, but elsewhere. And, and the music industry sort of looked at this and said, you know, this is a music Armageddon. You know, the, the CDs that we're selling that are highly profitable are being taken and turned into singles that are then freely traded. And we're creating a generation of pirates that ultimately will take down the industry. And it was, you know, a, a moment of, existential crisis for the people who ran the music industry who were getting huge bonuses and making millions of dollars. And so as with all businesses, a lot of the reactions, you know, were shaded by how they affected each person individually. 
And hmm. the, the people who had the most to lose in some ways weren't the shareholders, but were the, the executives who were making a lot of money. And that sort of made everyone somewhat conservative about how to go about solving the problem. Do you remember where you were, Paul, when you first heard about this thing called Napster? Did you discover it yourself or did someone bring it to you? The Recording Industry of America, the trade organization, had been aware of it early on. And so they had gone around and educated each of the, the companies, music companies, with what was going on. So we were aware of it early on. And there were many conversations about how to deal with it. But there wasn't a whole lot you could do because the nature of Napster was it was independent nodules through which you could anonymously share music and you could share entire libraries of music. So, of course, the first move was to bring lawsuits against individual individuals because you couldn't bring a lawsuit against an app because it actually wasn't, their software was out there in the world and it, there was no way you could create a connection between what they were doing and the, and the piracy, a legal connection at least. I remember the first time a friend sent me a file and it was that weird tension of, I shouldn't do this, but this is really intriguing. Wow, this is a whole new way to access music. Do, do you remember the experience of someone sending you music via Napster? Oh, I tried Napster for sure. As you know, I justify it as like, I have to learn what's going on. It wasn't how I got my music. because, Of course, I got a lot of CDs for free, but it was, you know, it was a wow experience. It's like, oh my God, look at this. I could get the entire Madonna catalog or the entire Credence catalog. And it was right there. And it was very good. It was as good. Put, them on, put your earphones on and it was as good as any CD that you could have bought. But your comment's interesting. It's like you suffered a bit of uh, guilt <laughs> around whether you should use that or not. And I, I would say some people felt that, but many people were angry at the music industry. Many customers were angry because the nature of the profits is that they would sell a CD for $20 US and the individual only wanted one or two songs. So they felt they were being forced into paying a lot more for the music that they actually wanted. And that in some ways was what made Napster popular because you could get the one song you wanted or the two songs you wanted without having to buy the entire album. And that was one of the cruxes of the, of the conflict and the challenge at the time. We've talked about sort of the executives and the shareholders and the customers, but what were the artists saying to you? The artists signed to the label, what was their reaction? The nature of music is it's sort of the anthem of the youth. The rebellion of youth is what starts you off as a musician. And so these musicians, if they were young starting off, were very much in favor of Napster because this was a way of getting their music heard and getting an audience. The people who tended to be against Napster were musicians that had already established their careers, had, were making a lot of money, and some of them were conflicted because the rebelliousness of Napster was something they, they felt in their hearts, but their pocketbooks were suffering. And that that created a problem for them. So I was thinking this morning, Paul, I did what I usually do when I sit down, start writing. I went onto Spotify, turned on a recommendations for an album. Within a second, I'm listening. And I thought, how far we've come in 20 years. And so I just want to fast forward slightly to 2002, 20 years ago. Naps has been shut down. The industry is a mess. There's no clear copyright rulings. And the music's being sliced up. Could you describe how it felt to be at Time Warner within the music division during this period of chaos? Well, it, was, it wasn't chaotic in quite that way. You, you went and did your job every day. It was still a very profitable business. The senior executives were trying to figure out how to solve the problem, which was how do you put a new format into the marketplace that gave people what they wanted and for which they would pay and uh, they'd still have a good experience. So th there were, you know, a lot of efforts made to bring that about. And it, in all cases, the history of the music industry has been a marriage between technology and content. And whether it was the gramophone or the tape recorder 
or the CD, there was always a patent holder, whether it be Philips or NBC, Sony, Microsoft, who then combined their technology with the music company to deliver content on that format, on that device. At this point, the iPod already existed. It was a beautifully designed product, but it was just another MP3 device. Sales were low and the user experience wasn't great. Apple and the rest of the market had a massive content problem. But at the same time, the music industry had a technology problem. A disruptive solution was desperately needed. I was in my office at uh, 75 Rockefeller Plaza in New York City. I had one of the nice corner offices. <laughs> I could see north along 6th Avenue to the building that's called 666, 6th Avenue. There was one call that came through to my phone. It was Barry Schuler, who was the head of AOL, and Time Warner and AOL had just merged. And Barry had Steve Jobs on the phone. And he said, Steve wants to talk about music. He wants to talk about a solution to the problem. Would you meet with him? I said, of course we would. And then he plugged Steve into the call. So the two of them were on the, the call with me. You know, Steve was very polite. And he said, you know, you guys have a problem. And I'd like to help you solve the problem if I can. And I said, well, that would be great because we, we need help with this problem. We organized to fly out to Cupertino to their headquarters and, and see what he had to say. Time for a quick break. So, Paul, who's suffering badly from laryngitis, two tech specialists from Warner Music and a representative from Sony Japan take a flight to California. They touch down and head straight for Apple's headquarters. We got there with, I think we had a rented car. We got out, introduced ourselves in the main entrance. It's, it's a beautiful building, beautifully architected, a lot of glass. They had our names at the door and there was a person who greeted us. It, it seemed like everybody at Apple wore the same clothes. It was sort of bizarre. Everyone had blue jeans and shirts. They all sort of, the men all seemed to dress like Steve Jobs. I'm sure they didn't, but... That was my memory of it. And we were taken up to, I think it was the second floor, third floor, Apple boardroom. It's a big room. It's a long table. There's a podium at one end and the blinds were closed because it was in the morning. It was a lot of sun coming in. And we sat on one side of the table, four of us. And the Apple people came in in the next couple of minutes. There were four or five of them. And they were our counterparts, and they were there to listen to what we had to say. We didn't know whether Steve was going to be in the room or not. He wasn't there when the meeting started. I had Kevin Gage, who was my associate, make the presentation. And he got through maybe two slides, and then the double doors to the boardroom open, and Steve walks in. Of course... The meeting stops. He sits near the door, away from everybody else, in this chair. You know, of course, when Steve walks in, everyone is aware he's there. He was sitting and rocking back and forth in his chair. And the longer Kevin made the presentation, the more agitated Steve became. And it was hard to listen to the presentation and watch Steve out of the corner of your eye because he realized he was getting, <laughs> he was getting upset for, no, for who knows why. And at one point, he leans forward and, and in a loud voice says, you guys in the music industry all have your heads up your asses. And of course... That stopped everything in the room. The Apple guys were quiet, intimidated probably, and our side, nobody knew what to say. In moments such as these, I like to think of three types of people. Ostriches, fighters, and pioneers. The ostriches are the people with their heads in the sand. 
or in this instance, perhaps their heads are somewhere else. They're ignoring the need for change. The fighters are determined to take down the competition at all costs. Then you have the pioneers who are prepared to show the humility to let go, challenge assumptions and do things differently. And I was a senior guy there. I leaned forward and looked at Steve and said, Steve, you're right. And that's why we're here. We need your help. And he paused and, and it was clear he was a little confused. It's like he had just sort of insulted us. <laughs> and I had humbled myself before him and, and he didn't know quite what to do. If you're the CEO, you're the boss. And he was a, what I'll call a heroic CEO. You know, he's a guy who had built the company from nothing. And, and most CEOs get to their place because of this enormous ambition and enormous ego and don't really know how to listen or don't listen enough. And it was clear that, that this is the sort of person that, that Steve was. You know, he had his ideas. He was the idea, the product idea person for the company. And so, you know, he heard me, but I'm not sure he really understood why it was that I wasn't yelling back at him, <laughs> telling him that, you know, he had his head up his ass, <laughs> which is, of course, how meetings end very quickly. But in reflecting on that meeting of, over the many years since, it's it, clear to me that, you know, just as the fortunes of countries are shaped by the individuals who run those countries, who are elected to be president or prime minister, the same is true of companies, that the CEOs define their, the path, their success or their failure in many cases. He, he had this iPod problem where he needed content but he had never really reached out to, or had successfully reached out to anybody in the music industry. And, and we were there. And I was, you know, happy to have him call me out like that because we needed him as well. Jobs knew he had a content problem, but hadn't been able to successfully reach out to the music industry. Paul knew Warner Music and the other record labels needed Apple but many were ostriches, too afraid to embrace the scale of disruption that was needed. He wanted to facilitate the bridge. We had worked with all the other technology companies and nobody at the senior level, the senior most level, was working with us. So Steve, in this unique way, as the senior most guy who had a problem, who wanted to help solve it, was willing to sort of engage with us because I was willing to engage with him. And that mm. sort of began six months of pretty intense discussions around what the product would be, what the consumer offering would be, what the security would be. And in the course of that time, you know, we developed, you know, a very good working relationship. And I surprised him at times because... I was not like many of the people in the music business. I had never aspired to be an artist, never aspired to be a musician. I was there, you know, doing my corporate thing, making money, raising my family. And so I didn't have an allegiance to the, to the industry in the same way other people did who had grown up in it. I was, you know, somebody who, who saw the industry as, you know, a business, as a job. And, and I also saw the absurdity of what was going on in the industry as it was struggling to f figure out how to solve its problem. And, and I, I think there was always in me a sense of sort of uh, moral equity. You do things in your, your job, your corporate job, because it's not just about making money. It's also about doing the right thing. And, you know, it was a unique thing because I was maybe only one of a few or maybe the only one who, who could have sat down with Steve and cut the deal that we did. There's a famous quote from the writer and tech professor Clay Shirky. He says, institutions will always try to preserve the problem to which they are the solution. It's one of my all-time favorite quotes about disruption because it suggests that there needs to be some kind of breakaway for meaningful change to happen. It often takes a moment of conflict or in Paul's case, some humility to let go 
and find a new path. We met first with Apple in 2002, and we did our deal, and I think I signed my agreement with him. I'm just looking at the... Yeah, I have the signature page over here. We did, signed our deal December 5th, 2002. What were you just looking at? Signature page of the agreement that Warner Music signed is my signature and Steve's signatures. Many years after I left Warner Music, somebody copied it and sent it to me, so I have it on my wall. Right, and, and so that's December the 5th. December the 5th, 2002. And it was then that he began his conversations with the other companies. So, of course, by December 5th, the technology was done. iTunes, the website, the application was all complete. So it took him basically four months to finish his deals with the other companies. The most important thing that he had to offer and that brought this to fruition was an elegant product solution that appealed to the CEOs of the other music companies when they had nothing else to show for a solution. So it was either Apple or nothing at that time. So some listeners, they may not remember this because they may have skipped this whole period, but I distinctly remember the first time I could buy a single for 99 cents rather than a whole album. And that this redefined your listening experience as a consumer. You were the person that came up with the 99 cents model. How did that idea come to you? And how did you put that forward to the rest of the industry? Well, as we were thinking through, you know, how are we going to make this attractive to the consumer? You know, the people who wanted to file share could file share and they got it for nothing. And it was good quality audio. But the thing that Apple had was an entire solution. It was the convenience of the downloading process and then the application itself, the way you chose the music, how you could search for the music. And he had a very elegant solution that was more convenient. And so the question for me was, so what's the market clearing or psychologically clearing price where the consumer will begin to be indifferent between something that's free and a little awkward or clunky and something for which you pay 99 cents and get this great, elegant experience. And because I'd spent a lot of time thinking about this process in the years before, it was clear to me that what consumers buy is not just the music. They buy the experience of the music, which was a CD, which was a thing you held and put into a Walkman and then listened to. And in this case, People were willing to pay a certain amount to get the experience with the music. And that number, you know, we thought to be indifferent, to get it into the market was 99 cents. So the, the idea was to make a price so low that nobody thought about it. And in these conversations, did you ever talk about what would happen to the integrity of the album? Yeah, I, I think everyone knew that once you crossed that Rubicon, the album was... You know, for people who wanted to buy CDs, and you could still buy CDs, but for those people who didn't want to buy the CD and wanted one or two songs, the album was no longer relevant. And it, it did have a lot of implications for artists because for many years before that, you know, from the time that you went from the vinyl, which was two sides, an A and a B side, you went to the vinyl album. And artists had begun to think about their work as the album, a selection of songs. And, and the idea of moving to singles again was sort of taking the artists back to a point in time 30 years before when they had only recorded singles, an A and a B side. And then it was only later that album-oriented music became an artistic or aesthetic expression. And so it, it has obviously changed the way that artists thought about their music. This shift back to the importance of singles not only changed how artists had to think creatively, but also how they would operate financially. Great creative work was now valued at less than a dollar. It accelerated a debate about fair royalties for artists that still continues 20 years later. The artists cut was defined by their artist agreements. 
and they all differed. And there was usually either a percentage of retail or some other flat percentage. That was not a, a negotiation because the artist agreements were already in place. The key question was how much of the 99 cents did Steve keep and how much did the music industry keep? And the other side of the negotiation was, you know, you set the price 99 cents, which was the price we set. He then had to negotiate with the other music companies to set their price, but he stuck with the 99 cents. So how much did Apple keep? I offered, you know, 33%, I believe 35%. And that was the typical distribution fee in the physical world. And of course, a lot of people on the music side said, well, this is all bits and bytes. There's no physical movement. You know, we should get a lot more. It, to some extent, there's a little truth to that. But on the other hand, what they didn't understand is that to set up server farms and to do all the stuff needed in order to host the music and then supply the technology, that they're a whole different set of expenses. And what I understood is that unless Apple made a reasonable profit, they wouldn't be in the business for the long term. And the, the mistake that the music industry was making was that it was going to squeeze so much out of its technology partner that the technology partner wouldn't you know, be a good partner or wouldn't be around. Hmm. And so my reasoning was if the industry had been highly profitable with a distribution fee in the physical world, you know, in the low 30 percent, then the same, you know, was appropriate for the um, digital world. So this moment iTunes has created really forever changed the way we think about accessing music. And a lot of things went right. I mean, Apple stock, I think, went from eight to 800 million. 10 billion tracks were sold in the iTunes store, I think, in the, the next eight years. What do you think you got right, you personally, Paul, in making that deal with Apple and Jobs? Well, I think what we got right was that we didn't resist the technology. We embraced the technology. We embraced the change. And it was a better consumer experience. It was, instead of being forced to buy 12 tracks, 18 tracks, you could buy the one you wanted. You could take it and you could listen to it the way you were accustomed to listening to music, which is portably. And I think iTunes' huge success in the next 10 years is a tribute to what we agreed at the beginning. And, and interestingly, while iTunes then disappeared, it disappeared because it was replaced by even better solutions, Spotify and others, which would not have developed if we had not done the iTunes deal in the first place. And Spotify went to a more atomic level and you no longer even had to own the music. You could sort of, in effect, own a service and you could get access to the music at any time and listen to it any time. And I think that's sort of where we are today. It's, it's mm -hmm. a, a point where people don't need to own music, which is an odd thing because there was a long period of time in which, you know, listening to music was associated with owning music. And now it's not. It's associated with owning an experience. So, Paul, you've since left the music industry behind and now write spy novels, which is a big change. How and why did you decide to make the leap? I had made a promise to myself as a young man in my late 20s that I was going to go to business school. And then when I was financially able, I was going to leave my business career and go back to what I had wanted to do when I first came to New York, which was to write novels. And in my 50s, mid 50s, that moment arrived. I'd sort of had it with corporate America. And I decided that I was going to change my life, go back to this dream I had had as a young man and jumped off the cliff, so to speak, without my training wings on, uh, hoping I would learn to fly on the way down. Too often you get stuck in a career because you need the money or you don't want to risk going off into the world. 
it's something you have to think about a lot and you have to want to do it. There's a, an apprenticeship that is at least 10,000 hours, which is a long time in years. And it's an interesting thing. You know, my, my wife sort of put up with my job and my sons didn't really care about the job I went to every day. <laughs> Mm. And when I decided to leave it and start to be a writer, it's like, oh, now we know what you do. And they were, they were very supportive. And it's important that whoever you are, whatever you do, you have to listen to that quiet voice inside you and let it speak to you at the right time in your life. It's interesting you say that about your children, because I, you know, friends, peers, colleagues that are making massive career transitions you know, there's real fear about leaping into that unknown. And I think, you know, one of the things I take away from the conversations with them is how so often their families feel a sense of relief and pride, you know, that they are finally deeply recognizing an integral part of themselves. So I think it's can connect to what you're saying. One last question. When you look back over your career, what do you think the most profound rethink moment has been? You know, it, it definitely was the recognition that in order to solve the music industry's problems, the music industry was going to have to disrupt itself. And it wasn't something that most of the executives in the industry were going to do. It required somebody who was going to give up the, the thing by which the industry measured its success, called profits, in exchange for something that is hard to measure, which is called consumer satisfaction. And sometimes they're the same, and sometimes they're not the same. And in the case of the music industry, there was sort of this false sense of consumer satisfaction in the CD. But in fact, the CD was this artificial product that assembled all these songs that gave the music industry a lot of profit. But it wasn't all that satisfying to a lot of the consumers. The consumers really wanted singles. They wanted to listen portably. And so the rethink moment was the recognition that the industry wasn't going to disrupt itself, hmm. didn't have an incentive to disrupt itself. You know, my question is, so where is the music industry in 20 years? It's mm -hmm. gotten to the atomic level of a listen. So where does technology take it in the future? I don't know. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Paul as much as I did. I'd love it if you'd subscribe to Rethink Moments and do leave us a review. It really helps new listeners find the show. I'm also on LinkedIn. You can find me there and you can join our Rethink Moments newsletter community of over 45,000 people. Ask me questions, send in ideas for guests or leave honest feedback. On Twitter and Instagram, I'm at Rachel Bosman. And if you have any questions or ideas, send them to me over email. Please do get in touch. And that's rachel at rethinkmoments.com. I'll speak to you soon for another episode of Rethink Moments. Rethink Moments is truly a collective effort. The show is developed and written by me, Rachel Botsman, with Will Hain and Alex Sansom. Our Rethink Moments team includes our wonderful producers, Kat Davy and Carenza Metric, and Phoebe Adler-Ryan, our researcher. Editing, mixing, and additional scripting is by our friends at Rethink Audio, Matt Hill and Anushka Tate. Sound engineering by Nick Morbath at Evolution Studios, and our original theme music is composed by Ben Sansom. And thanks to Jesse Hempel and the team at LinkedIn for all their support. <laughs>